G'day everyone, welcome back to another round review. Uh, again, acknowledging the fact that we are still halfway through a round. But in today's video, I'm going to be talking about all the games that have happened so far. Of course, the Anzac Day clashes, both the Anzac Day Eve clash between Melbourne and Richmond and Collingwood and Essendon haven't happened yet. But I'm still out here making the video because, to be honest, my routine isn't so flexible right now being on holiday in America. Uh, so I'm just going to have a crack at these games in today's video. And then potentially if I get time, I'll uh, talk about the other games, which is not ideal for you, I know. I'm sorry. But I'm doing my best. It was a late night last night. I uh, went to a bar in uh, around the DC area and watched Garcia versus Davis in that boxing fight. That was great. In addition to all the time zone issues, my own routine, and uh, constantly being just a little bit hungover, there are some challenges to doing this on the road. But here we are today to talk about the round so far in round six. It's a bit of a shame because uh, Melbourne, Richmond, and Collingwood and Essendon are some of the bigger games from this round. Uh, but if anything interesting happens in those games, I will probably will find the time, maybe stay up late one night, and do a video talking about those topics. I'm really talking about if Essendon somehow knock off Collingwood. That would probably be warranting of a video, but we'll see what happens. But we're going to talk about the round so far. There have been some uh, some interesting results. They're all interesting. At this point of the season, it's a, it's a fascinating season in a way. Uh, we always get wacky results in the first couple of months until the season settles, but I think as it currently stands, we have five of the top eight last year currently in the bottom ten. So things are shaking up, and things are looking like they're going to stay that way when you particularly look at someone like a St Kilda, who don't look like they're going anywhere soon. But before we get into all the rounds action, do know that we are sponsored by Manscaped com here at True Footy HQ for anyone needing um, help with their manscaping routine. Not in terms of the actual service of helping you, but if you're looking for top quality products, uh, the actual lawnmower 4.0, the chest and body hair trimmer, fantastic product. I use it myself. I probably need to uh, up my manscaping game, but I'm on holiday at the moment. I got a grease trip coming up in a couple of weeks. I definitely need to uh, get back into shape for that trip. It's probably going to be a lot of beach stuff. But on top of all that, you get your liquid formulations, your ball deodorants, your ball moisturizers your boxes and there's a cologne in there as well which I really like and I also use that for gifts as well uh, if I've got a brother's or a uh, cousin's birthday coming up or even just a mate uh, I probably wouldn't buy them the ball trimmer but I would get them the Manscaped cologne that's uh, something that I particularly like to use but people who watch True Footy get 20% off and free shipping by using the code TRUEFOOTY20 at checkout on any of their wonderful products so do yourself a favor do your balls a favor and do True Footy a favor if uh, there is a product that you need by using that discount code and in Enjoy. So the first game we're going to talk about is Fremantle versus the Western Bulldogs at Optus Stadium. And this game sort of went how I expected it. I did tip the Bulldogs. I felt more confident about them going into this game. But I didn't expect them to run away 49 point winners in such dramatic fashion. Fremantle again struggled to get inside 50. They had just 8 marks inside 50 in comparison to the Bulldogs who had 16. And the ability of the Bulldogs to keep it in their forward line when they did get it inside 50 was another feature as well. So it was a very strong performance from a Bulldogs outfit that just looked far more organized and far more strong than Fremantle did on this occasion. Bontempelli again was huge in this game and he's shaping up for a potentially brown low season. He certainly think he's in the All-Australian side right now. In fact, he's probably top handful of plays in the competition. He had two goals. He had 31 touches. He had 10 tackles. His tackling and his clearance game in particular has been really uh, strong this season. You back that up with the fact that every possession he has is intentional. Everything he does gets his side into a better position. He was a massive factor on this game. Trelaw's having a good season as well. He had 35 touches in this game along with two goals and Jack McRae also had 14 clearances which I think is the most he's had in any game. It was a good ruck battle in this game going into it because we saw two of the stronger rucks in the competition right now go head to head. Tim English is probably the runaway all Australian favourite right now for his form this season coming up against Sean Darcy who's an absolute monster and stylistically they're quite different as well. Sean Darcy's a bit more of a physical, hard to beat in the actual tap game ruck, whereas Tim English is probably the best in the game around the ground right now. And that's sort of how this ruck battle unfolded. Sean Darcy won the hitouts, and Tim English was fantastic around the ground as he has been all year. English is getting better at the contested sort of ruck battle side of his game as well. He's always been good around the ground, but his evolution into the player he has become is a huge plus for the Bulldogs, and like I said, probably going to be the All-Australian peak right now. For the Dockers, this is a really, really concerning result, and probably for me, they don't look any near a finals quality side right now and I don't want to say season over because it's early and I think they're two and four and you can come back from that but they haven't really put together any meaningful form this year that suggests that they're going to snap back to last year's form so other than Caleb Sarong having a fantastic season in general but again he had 35 touches and 10 clearances in this game they look a long way off their best from last year and in particular the scores that they've conceded throughout this year have been really concerning I guess 118 points conceded 
at home to a side that uh, finished below them on the ladder last year. That brings their average conceded points up per game from 68 to 88, which shows that a strength last year has become a bit of a weakness. Much has been said on the of the intention on Rory Lobb in this game, uh, as Fremantle were really trying to get stuck into him. I don't think it had a massive bearing on the result, but there is some damning footage where uh, I think about six Fremantle players ran, went to Lobb when somebody, I think it was Ugo Hagen, was lining up for goal. And I have to say, as a sneaky Snyder remark from an Eagles fan, if you're going to get distracted a little bit on field and put time into a player, at least make it a better player than Rory Lobb. And after that uh, smart-ass comment from an Eagles fan, we will talk about how the Eagles got rolled by Port Adelaide by 40 points at Adelaide Oval on Saturday morning. I stayed up late on Saturday, on um, Friday night actually here to watch us get rolled. And it was kind of a carbon copy of the Geelong game to a lesser extent where uh, Port Adelaide kind of killed the game off by half-time. We're far better in the clinches. Connor Rosie was fantastic, both on the inside and the outside. The tackling game, his inside game is really strong. Wrong, but he was damaging on the outside with a really good long range uh, goal as well from outside 50. It's been the story of the year so far for the Eagles where a, a second term fade out has ultimately cost them the game and the result in the end is about right. Port Adelaide uh, should play finals this year in my opinion. The fact that they got 40 points up against the Eagles, that scoreline is about right. It's just for the Eagles about tweaking those second terms so we don't have massive fade outs because you do fear the time where we're unable to get into action and that 40 point loss could become a 70 or 80 point loss which is something we want to avoid. Finlay and also kicked five goals on us as well. He had a pretty good game. And on the whole, Port Adelaide just did what they needed to do in this game. There were some bright sparks for the Eagles as well. Bailey Williams admittedly uh, probably had his weakest opponent in the ruck so far throughout his career, perhaps in Bryn Tickle. But it was good to see him sort of get a hold of the game. He had 37 hitouts, as you'd expect. 13 clearances as well. I think it's just work rate and second efforts at ground level that have really come on this year. And it's nice to have a little look into the development of his career, where yes, he's the disadvantaged ruck in most situations, because he's smaller, younger, and a little bit weaker than most opponents. And you finally put him against a guy who's a similar age but less experienced, and you can see the fruits of, uh, of the development we put into Bailey Williams. Hopefully, he can take that forward and become better against better opponents in the future. And shout out to Jai Kelly as well, who kicked four goals. I think he's a midfielder with a bit of forward craft. I'd like to see him play maybe 50-50 in the future. It was nice to see him kick four goals in his seventh game and potentially build some confidence and hopefully stay in the side for the rest of the year. The next game was GWS and the Brisbane Lions at Mar Oval and again on paper this was a pretty lopsided affair with Brisbane being heavy favourites but it turned out to be a fairly good game and it took a monstrous performance from Charlie Cameron, one of his best at AFL level you have to say, kicking seven goals he was absolutely everywhere, he was arguably the difference maker when they win the game by 20 points the Brisbane Lions, uh, Charlie Cameron kicking seven goals was critical to that and it'll be interesting to see how he goes for the goal of the year award with that uh, weird soccer off the side of his foot, no idea if that was deliberate, I'm inclined to think it wasn't but let me know in the comments what you think for the Giants this was a fairly amicable loss They've actually lost eight in a row at Monica, which is not ideal when you consider it's kind of their home away from home, they call it, uh, almost like a secondary home ground. But let's not take it out of context. This was a fairly solid performance against one of the better teams in the competition. I thought with Tom Green out through suspension, the midfielders really stepped up. Cornelio and Kelly combined for something like 79 possessions. Again, a positive sign for the Giants, I think, for a side that is considered a lowly side this year. I think they've been pretty respectable in all their performances this year. In this game, I think what was critical was they kind of overused the footy, dominated possession. I think they had something like 100 more disposals, but eight less inside 50s as well. So a lot of getting the ball and not really being, uh, being a little bit stagnant with it, not really using it forward productively. And by contrast, Brisbane were a lot more effective going forward. But you expect that. You expect Brisbane to be the slicker side. Their scoring power, their ability to move the ball quicker was certainly evident in this game and uh, they notch up an important four points. Then we had the grand final replay and uh, this went surprisingly to script uh, compa in comparison to last year's grand final of course. In fact they exceeded it. They won this game by 93 points after winning the grand final by 80 points and this, this result shocked me. I tipped the Swans which I forgot. I checked the score when I woke up. I didn't see the game live. I had to watch a replay and some of the analysis but when I saw the result I actually forgot that I tipped Sydney's so I got a tip wrong by 100 points. But yeah, this game was one-way traffic with the Swans only kicking three behinds in the second half and no goals, which was a little bit of an uncharacteristic, like, I don't want to say pathetic because I think that's harsh with their injury issues, but 
this Sydney side that's an uncharacteristic way to sort of just keel over and let the another side walk all over you and it's perhaps a little bit of a trend obviously we saw it in the grand final they got absolutely rolled a few weeks ago against Melbourne as well they kind of they stuck with them late and then Melbourne kicked away I don't know probably reading too much into it when you consider as well the fact that Sydney's back line is completely decimated and they were just unequipped in this game to deal with guys like Cameron and Hawkins who kicked five goals each from what I saw Callum Mills spent two and a half quarters on Tom Hawkins as well and Callum Mills is like six foot one so when that sort of stuff's happening it's hard to really blame them for the effort I'm not sure I guess we'll have to see if it becomes a trend but I am empathetic to Sydney's injury issues at the moment when you consider as well it's an entire back line almost where the Cats really got the job done was uh, really with their link up play on the outside of the contest I think the clearance battle was fairly similar but the Cats moved the ball a lot more smoother which put all this undue pressure on Sydney's undermanned back line as well and that's where they really kicked their asses and Pat Dangerfield uh, probably had his best game for the year I think or close to he had 31 possessions a goal and 7 clearances and as I said before the two key forwards kicked 5 goals each which you'd expect uh, when the Sydney back line is short and as undermanned as it was. But while I focused on the adversity that Sydney's facing here, we have acknowledged that Geelong are starting to kick back into the gear. They smashed Hawthorne, they smashed West Coast, and now they smashed Sydney as well. And while there's caveats to all of those wins, you know, Hawthorne and West Coast kind of suck and Sydney are a little bit undermanned, we're still seeing the evolution of Geelong back to some of their best footy. And they've done this time and time again. They start season slow, they come good, and I think we're starting to see that with Geelong, and their percentage actually puts them back up into the top eight. Then we're into the Sunday games and Hawthorne took on the Adelaide Crows down in Tasmania and I bravely tipped Hawthorne in this game. I couldn't really justify why, although some people in the comments let me know that Adelaide have a terrible record in Tasmania and I just had a gut feeling that Hawthorne would win and I nearly got that right with them leading by nine points in the dying stages of this game before Adelaide recorded a, uh, a clutch come from behind victory, largely thanks to Darcy Fogarty's great set shot uh, with a minute and a half to go to put them in front and Adelaide held on to win this game by three points. So we've talked about Adelaide a lot on this channel lately and uh, they're in great form and in fact this is the first time they've won four games in a row under their coach Matthew Nix and their first win in uh, Tasmania since 2005. Hawthorne have won something like 55 of the previous 75 in Tasmania since 2001 and when you consider as well that they've been good and bad and good and bad through that period that's a very very good strike rate. It was a very contested sort of game, this one. A lot of uh, stoppages, 165 tackles, which was actually the most of any game so far this year. For the Crows, their elder statesman really got the job done. Tex kicked four goals. Sloan had probably his best game at AFL level this particular season with 30 touches and seven tackles. And Laird, as well, had 10 clearances in the midfield. From a Hawthorne perspective, uh, this is an encouraging result. When you consider Adelaide of, like fourth on the ladder right now, and it probably becomes fifth if uh, Collingwood win. Uh, no, if, if Melbourne beat Richmond. Adelaide will be fifth at the end of this round. So to hold pace with them, and considering the form they're in, they just beat Carlton by 56 points last week. This is an encouraging result. Two weeks in a row, they've kept pace with some sides that we think are better than them. It shows that they're not that far off the pace, and they get the added bonus as well of uh, staying on bottom spot and uh, potentially getting Harley Reid at the end of the year. Some positives for them. Fergus Green bowled up with another three goals, really showing that he was a really shrewd pickup in the offseason, and Connor Nash had 28 possessions and seven clearances in this game. Newcomb and Warple were typically strong through the clearance is combining for 15 between them and Sicily again I think he's leading the competition in marks he had another 11 marks and 27 possessions in this game so a result that both sides can walk away pretty satisfied from Hawthorne kept pace with a very strong Adelaide side nearly got the job done and Adelaide just record four points in a danger game for for most clubs let alone Adelaide who has a poor record in Tasmania get the four points move on good result Carlton then took on St Kilda at Marvel Stadium in a game which would have been one of the more interesting ones uh, when you look at some of the hot matchups from this round and with St Kilda prevailing by 22 points and Carlton's form has dipped a little bit in the last couple of weeks no doubt obviously nine goal loss last week against the Crows but the first two and a half quarters were really really uh, evenly matched. There was 11 lead changes before the Saints banged a few late in the third term and really held their lead from that point on. It was another game this round where one side dominated possessions. I think Carlton recorded a monstrous 446 disposals in this game, but had four less since half 50 so over-possessing a little bit, not really being proactive with their ball use to the same extent. Potentially a little bit predictable going forward as well with Mackay and Kerno being so good that they're tempted to go for them most occasions. They're also a little bit wasteful in front of goal. I think I think back to a couple of misses by Mackay in that third term. But the top six ball winners in this game were all Carlton players with all of Walsh, 
Chera and Blake Akers having more than 35 touches. But defensively, St Kilda's system held up so well as it has all year. Callum Wilkie and Josh Battle combining as well for another really, really good performance down back. It wasn't a game where any Saints really got a hold of them statistically, but uh, Dan Butler kicked three goals. Machido Owens kicked another couple of goals. Gresham was also really productive with 20 touches and a goal, and Jack Sinclair has been good all year running off halfback and providing some running carry. So the Saints grab another four points. That's five wins from six games with one single goal loss to Collingwood last week. And they've got a tasty, yes, tasty clash against the power on Friday night, I think it is, which means it's a five-day break, but they stay local and they play Port Adelaide, which will be a really, really interesting clash. And finally, the last Sunday game was between the Gold Coast Suns and North Melbourne, and Gold Coast broke the shackles. They've had some indifferent form this year. Yes, a win over Geelong, but a big 43 or something point win over North Melbourne shows that they've taken a step in the right direction. It has come at a cost, however. Took Miller's done his knee in this game. We don't know how bad it is. I believe he's going to be waiting scans on Monday, and by the time this video comes out, we'll probably have the answer to that, but that's a big blow in terms of whatever slim finals hopes they had. On the plus side, however, there was a couple of players that returned from ACLs last year who have come good in this game in particular. Ben King kicked four first half goals, ended with five goals, and Lockie Wellers moved into this season pretty smoothly, and he was one of the best of field in this game with 28 possessions and 14 marks. And that was where Gold Coast really got a hold in North Melbourne. It was the outside battle. The contested possessions of this game were fairly even, but the Suns had a monstrous 71 more uncontested possessions, which indicates that they moved the ball around the field a lot better, and doubled them in marks, 135 marks to just 69. The Roos were pretty disappointing in Todd Goldstein's 300th game. We saw some regular stars for them in this game kind of disappear a little bit. Sheasel had the uh, handcuff put on him by Nick Holman in this game and finished with just 11 touches. LDU, by the same token, had 20 possessions and just a couple of clearances in this game, and I don't know whether the Roos just a little bit tired after a great start to the season or if they've been found out a little bit tactically I think it's a little bit both with uh, two key players to North success so far this year being more or less shut out of this game but North going inside 50 were particularly disappointing in this game with just 38% efficiency going forward so a dirty day at the office for the Roos they've had a good start to the season I tipped them in this game I thought they would do better but perhaps they're just stagnating a little bit. All right, guys, that is my thoughts on the first seven games of round six. Again, apologies that uh, I don't have time to wait a couple of days until the round actually finishes, but like I said, we'll do some content to cover all of that. Thanks again for watching. Apologies for the screaming children in the background of this video and, and potentially some of the American wildlife. I'll see what I can do on the editing on this. But either way, thank you for watching. I appreciate you all, and I'll see you in the next video. Cheers.